Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our special JPAC meeting uh, today, June 11th at 1 p.m. Uh, thank you all for being able to be with us this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to mention a few things prior to the start of the meeting. Uh, I'll open our meeting by asking comments from Chief Powers and Chief Pyle. Um, we will also, we will then begin with our agenda. Please raise your digital hand in Zoom so that we can recognize you as you speak. Uh, when you address the group for the first time, please state your name and position as it relates to JPAC or whether you're a community member. Uh, and comments and questions by both JPAC, members of JPAC and the public will be limited to three minutes. My hope is that this provides an efficient conversation dialogue for us today. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention <coughs> just quickly uh, is our charge. Uh, and the charge of JPAC is that the council shall develop and maintain productive lines of communication between members of the city university community and the police departments with whom they serve. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, uh, Chief Pyle, if you'd like to make an opening statement related to JPEG, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> Welcome everybody. Uh, appreciate the, uh, everybody being here today. Appreciate the, everybody's willingness to work on such a short schedule. Uh, we, Chief Powers and I recognize the need to uh, get JPAC together over the summer, uh, uh, as uh, one of you recommended that we do. I think it was Jackie. Uh, Jackie Wolf recommended we get together. We uh, we went to work right away. Uh, last meeting, we discussed uh, developing some the history of racism training in uh, uh, America, history of racism in America, uh, and, and uh, I'm I'm happy to report, and I'll let Jackie uh, carry the torch for that, but. Uh, that we have made significant progress in just the past week. Um, and we're working on securing a location for providing that training to the two departments uh, into July. And uh, we've already met with the uh, uh, history department and got preliminary discussions going. And so I'm happy about that. Hope that we can talk about that uh, today. So, Chief Powers. Um. So I apologize, I was having some technological issues and not only was I having difficulty getting on, hopefully you all can see me and hear me at this point, um, but I, was, I had no audio and so I had, to, I had to dump my desktop connection and join from my iPad. So as a result, I, uh, I didn't hear any of the introduction or anything. So um, I'm confident that, uh, um, that I would concur with whatever you were sharing. Uh, Chief Pyle, I know I heard you mention the, the uh, class that the history department is um, working on and, and I'm also very excited about that and looking forward to, uh, to getting that up and running. Great, thanks Chief Powers. Um, if there are no other comments to begin, we'll start with our agenda. Uh, the first on the agenda was the Police Community Forum, and I believe that uh, Chief Pyle brought that to the agenda. Do we want to talk a little bit, uh, Chief Pyle or Chief Powers, about how uh, the Police Community Forum idea came up and uh, some thoughts related to that? Uh, yeah, so so a new acquaintance of mine, Henry Wood, who I think is here with us. Are you here? Yeah, Henry? yeah I'm here. Yeah, he's listed down there as the, the other Tom Pyle. Good to have <laughs> you here, Henry. Thank you. So, Thanks, so, so Henry is a uh, um, Athens County native and uh, like me and uh, reached out to several of us a week and a half or so ago and asked to meet. Uh, asked to be part of the conversation, part of solutions. Um, and uh, he, in his initial email to Chief Powers, the sheriff, and I uh, had suggested that we could uh, uh, develop a police community forum. And I think Henry was pleasantly surprised that, that to learn that we've been doing that for, for years and that we had an organization like JPAC who, had, who has uh, in recent years uh, helped facilitate those kinds of things. Um, and so Henry and I met uh, Monday and had a, a lovely get to know each other chat and uh, decided that we, we really wanted to be, um, um, you know, uh, develop a relationship and, and, and both of us be part of the solution. So 
Um, I think the, the premise of a, a police community dialogue is to, to basically meet the, the community and answer questions and let them know the kinds of things that we have done, will do, plan to do, uh, to try to assure our local community that they have a, um, an accessible, transparent, and uh, quality law enforcement presence in all of our agencies. Is that accurate, Henry? That's very accurate, yeah. Uh, you know, obviously we're all concerned uh, since the events that have arised and uh, as being uh, one of the more senior black members of the community, I felt uh, I'm, I'm not reaching out as if I felt there was an issue, but wanted to make sure that there weren't issues and uh, how to resolve any issues if there were. So uh, Chief Pyle was uh, cordial enough and Mayor uh, Patterson uh, to meet with me. And we had, a, a, as he said, a very great conversation. And uh, I want to get the bearings from both the Athens police, the uh, OU police and the sheriff's office as to what's happening, what's not happening, and how we can uh, better uh, meet the issues of the members of the community. And uh, I'm a retired person, and you find me right now in the middle of one of my rental properties trying to do some work. And uh, that's former former uh, Ohio University employee. I, if anyone is curious, I invited Henry to to come. Yep. Thanks, Henry, for being with us today. We appreciate it. I know in the past we've uh, discussed what OUPD and what APD has done. Um, I don't know that we've had the sheriff's office in attendance. Perhaps we have in a meeting, I don't know, occasionally. Uh, our charge was initially not to include them. I know we have a representative from the Ohio uh, uh, State Highway Patrol with us today. Um, and so the conversation uh, has been a positive one throughout. Uh, I don't know if each of the chiefs want to talk or, or Henry, I guess the question to you is what's most helpful to you? Uh, if you want to hear the history of sort of how OUPD or APD has done some training or what's been effective, or maybe this part was covered in a meeting that you had previously. Uh, I've heard uh, quite a bit uh, from the Athens PD. I have not heard, uh, I haven't had the chance to meet with uh, Chief Pyle, uh, I'm sorry, Chief uh, Power. So I haven't heard anything about the OU training at all. So it would be uh, beneficial if I heard that, uh, but if that could also be put in a separate meeting with Chief Powers if he, if he would like. Henry, would you witness for me that I spoke politely and kindly about Chief Powers? He did, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a good thing he had you witness that, uh, Henry, because I wouldn't have believed it otherwise. Um, okay. <laughs> I've changed the habits of a lifetime. He usually doesn't miss an opportunity to get a dig in. So, um, uh, I imagine I, you throw out probably, I bet you throw it back. Um, I, I, I would say that's probably fair. That, that's probably <laughs> fair. Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm, uh, I'm glad that we have that, that type of working relationship. I think that's helpful for our agencies. Um, Henry, I apologize that I had not reached back out to you to try and schedule a meeting of my own with you. Um, my, my life's been a little bit disrupted in the last week or so for a number of reasons that have nothing to do with work. Um, but I do have, a, have on my list that I wanted to loop back to you, and, and I think it would be very helpful. I'd like to spend some time with you. Um, so that I can answer all of your questions and um, and hear about your perspective. I think it's important to um, to hear as many different perspectives as we can as we as we look at our uh, our way of doing business, our policies, our procedures, and and um, where our opportunities for improvement are. So, um, and then I think that that once we've done that, once you've had an opportunity to to hear from both of us. 
um, what would be helpful from, from my perspective uh, would be to get a sense from you as to what is helpful for us to share more broadly. Um, what is help uh, and what is the right format to do that? Um, what, what do people, what are the, the questions and the things that, the things that, that seem consequential to me or may seem consequential to Chief Pyle sometimes are not what the community cares about at that moment. And so sorting through that, I think will help us be more effective in shaping whatever ultimately comes from this in terms of a, of a community forum. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other conversation related to this particular topic? I, th I know that uh, one of our intents, um, and this is for all of JPEG, certainly for Henry and for our guests joining us online too, is we had had a conversation at the start of this year in January about doing more outreach uh, within Athens and on campus as well. And so my hope is once we um, are able to do that in a face-to-face -face setting that we'll be able to develop those and um, engage in different ways in the city uh, and at the university level too. I would say uh, one other thing uh, that by having this, uh, uh, forum. It's going to be uh, Chief Pyle and I were talking about the fact that many of the students that uh, come to Ohio University come from uh, different type of communities than particularly Athens, Ohio. So uh, they come in with a certain angst or uh, uh, anxiety that uh, is not necessarily developed from Athens, or but from the communities that they come from. So uh, the ability to meet with uh, students and give them some assurance of what, uh, how the police department operates and, and what they do and do not do, I think would uh, definitely put them at ease and they could possibly pass that on back to uh, their families. Thanks, Henry. Uh, Mary Catherine Tran uh, has a question, and then I see that there's a question from Aaron uh, too in the chat. So Mary Catherine, if you wanna go first and introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi everybody, my name is Mary Catherine Tran. I work in diversity and inclusion at Ohio University. So I represent under the underrepresented populations at the university. My question is actually for Jackie in regards to um, the program coming up. I'm wondering who is involved in the committee planning process for that event and if we have representation from DNI or African American Studies or the like, because I really wanted to be involved with helping with that process. And I'm wondering what are the stages and where are we sitting with that? Wait, Mary Catherine, before we get to that, because we haven't even gotten to that, that agenda item, I, I, I had a question, and I'm happy to answer that. Um, I, I had a question about the commun proposed community forum, because it does sound like um, it's not going to happen until students return. And you know, you, my guess is already the university is saying we don't want large gatherings. Everyone's even concerned about classes and how small or how large they'll be. Um, so I, so my, I take it this community forum is really just on the shelf for a while. Is that right? Well, uh, I'll speak first and then uh, uh, Chief Pyle can also uh, put his input in, but we had discussed that there might uh, end up being a couple forms, one of which that we would uh, be more inclusive of uh, the community as a whole right now, uh, as this issue is, is pretty hot and then possibly a second forum in which that we would uh, do it with the uh, students as they come back on campus. Now, uh, we did not discuss uh, the particulars about the COVID and how uh, that might transpire, but I would agree with you that it may have to be delayed for a time. 
Oh, okay. So these are so these are two completely separate things. We have the community forum, a series of those, but then also the training for the precincts, correct? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Aaron, who joined us, has a question. Aaron, if you want to go ahead with your question. Can we let Aaron in or can we give Aaron access? <clears throat> Go ahead, Aaron. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yep. Oh, perfect. Um, I actually might put off my question. Were you saying that this, uh, this course, this tr history training course was being uh, handled as a later item? It's the next agenda item. That's okay. correct. I'll wait. Sorry about that. No problem. We'll Same get back to you. Thank you very much. Any other conversation related to the police community forum? I think you're right. I think we'll have to um, wait for, obviously, for students to return, but certainly able to revisit. Tom, you had a well, just a comment that the city does have a certain amount of technological capability that we could leverage to have conversations. We might want to have them smaller so they're productive, but but we could, uh, and I'm willing to host a series of of uh, electronic, uh, you know, uh, virtual meetings with uh, folks very similar to what we're doing right now, where people could ask questions, we could answer questions, we could have dialogue. Although I, I I'm going to suggest that it's not the most effective way to have a, an open and and uh, dialogue and it doesn't necessarily feel welcoming, but it is something I would consider doing uh, to, to benefit the community if, mm -hmm. if if we thought that was a good idea. I'm not, I, uh, I, I just want to have effective outreach to the community and, 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 and answer questions because I'm sure they're out there. Mm -hmm. My initial thoughts is that uh, a face-to-face -face would be a lot more productive than uh, a virtual meeting. I'm in small settings. I I find it's okay, but when we're trying to answer questions and I don't know, it just seems like a open meeting would be better. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Henry. And, and there are things that we could do. We have the accessibility to the community center, which is we could put all three of the, the community center rooms together, tape off, you know, the six foot distances and stuff like that. But um, there's a certain amount of liability that, that entities assume when they draw crowds in. And I'm not sure the city uh, would want to assume that. I'm not sure the insurance carrier, quite frankly, would, would want us to do that. So uh, we'll just, I, I, yeah, well, I just have to play it all by ear, I guess. Uh, and I think that, to Henry's point, too, about students that come from uh, other places outside of Athens, you know, their ability to get to the community center might be less than two. And so maybe somewhere in the middle. And so maybe January is the time that we could look at that, if that's agreeable to folks. If, if there's comfort with doing something in person that is socially appropriately socially distanced um, and the university is okay with it that there are some large spaces like the Walter Field House that that you know we could literally set out chairs that were you know a full six feet apart that we could mark a one-way system for people to get to their seats we could set up a, a panelist panel that that's properly distanced um, you know, assuming the availability of the space. And I just thought of that location just because it's a football field, literally an enclosed football field. So in some respects, we've got some, some distance markers already built into it, but um, it, it would be a large enough space that you could accommodate a fairly significant number of people and maintain social distancing. But uh, to Tom's point, it's going to be if the university is comfortable with that and the, sort of the legal parameters around it are um, met. And I'm happy to follow up on availability of the field house and see what dates potentially could work. It's worth the ask. Yeah. Yeah. Dara has a question. Chad. Yeah. I, I just want to say we might want to consider 
both. Like, because so many people are, are thinking about this issue right now, it seems a shame to delay for months before we um, open up for public um, sure. conversation, dialogue back and forth, even, even if it has to be in this electronic and less effective um, setting, um, just so, so that people who, who want to engage now um, have an opportunity to, and um, and then hopefully it's something that is, is ongoing and, and we could do it in, in the preferable in-person setting later if, if we can't do that now. Just. I would agree with Sarah. I can't figure out how to raise my hand, but this is Karen. <laughs> you, you were on the screen a minute ago, Karen, and you disappeared. Yeah, I was gonna say, I didn't. Go ahead, Karen. I was just gonna, well, sorry, go ahead, Karen. She oh, muted. muted. Karen, we can't hear you. You're muted. Josh, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I mean, I was just going to chime in and just say that, you know, I, I think what we're seeing right now, we're seeing people who are willing to stand on the street for five hours together, shoulder to shoulder, wearing masks uh, to talk about these issues. I don't think getting together in a public setting is going to be that big of a barrier for a lot of people. Um, I think they would be happy to do that. Um, you know, right now the state is allowing movie theaters to open back up. There's things that we, so there's guidelines out there that I think if those were followed the same way, if, the, if, if movie 10 and the Athena Grand can open up and start showing movies with no liability and no issues there, I, I, I don't think it would be as quite a big of an issue for us to try and have something following similar guidelines in that type of setting. Um, now I'm not saying we need to do it right away, but I don't, I, I, I think, I feel like if we don't try to make some sort of an effort like that, um, when other things are opening up and other gatherings are happening, again, from a PR perspective, I think it just looks like we're just, we're, we're kind of just waiting, we're hiding, we're, oh, maybe the issue will go away. I think we need to be proactive and stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. I would, I would actually disagree. Um, I think that we can advertise an online discussion. I'm, I fear, and I'm speaking to someone who works in a medical school, I fear that Americans are becoming way too cavalier about this incredibly dangerous virus. And um, I think, you know, we're not being careful. And yes, states are opening up. And yes, you know, we're not seeing it because people are talking about George Floyd as they should, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to the pandemic. The pandemic is becoming very, very serious in some states. Rates are rising. Um, so I, you know, we can't be cavalier about this and say, if things are opening up, we should have an open forum. I'm, I, I, you know, I think we need to be more careful. Sure. Well, perhaps our best approach is a hybrid approach. If something as spacious as the Walter Field House is available and the university would allow for that to be used, that that could be an idea. And we could also couple that with, as Chief Bow said earlier, perhaps some smaller group, you know, are there groups that we could identify um, on campus and in the community, or do we just open community police forums? I think we'd have to talk about that a little more in depth and figure out how that would work in the Chief's availability. Um, I want to, I don't know how to raise my hand. So um, I apologize. My name is Lisa. I'm a community member um, on JPAC. So I, I kind of want to back up what Josh said and, and say I agree with him and I don't know how we do it, do it and be safe. Um, and Jackie, I hear what you're saying. Absolutely. Um, but I want us to be aware that when we had this same conversation months ago, then we kind of had a lull in and addressing and becoming public and, and moving forward. And I think it, it, what we talked about then was things happen and, and we, we plan and then we, you know, we run into a situation or something comes up or something else comes up. I appreciate Chief Pyle reaching out to Henry and starting those conversations already. Um, I think it's super important that we, we figure this out and how to do it effectively as soon as possible. Um, if we wait till students come back, if they come back, we're another two, three months out. And how far are we out then from the original date, which was back in the fall mm -hmm. when, when we 
you know, first started these conversations. So I just, however it needs to happen, I think there are enough JPAC people that we could divide and conquer and coming up with multiple little things or something at the Walter Fieldhouse. But I agree with Josh. I think it's important we figure it out and do something before students come back. And just so you, you I'm not gonna speak for Chief Powers, but just so everyone uh, knows my point of view, is I'm willing to put on a sandwich board and stand on the street corner of Court Street and answer questions from the community. All right, it's important to me. So I, I will do whatever is needed, uh, whatever JPAC thinks should be done. Um, I'll meet and to discuss just about anything with anybody. So I, I agree. I I I don't know that I'm quite ready to put on the sandwich board, um, but. Um, <laughs> I like the the concept of, of that, and um, you know, I I, I thought about um, last year actually trying to set up sort of um, um, office hours, if you will, where I could just sort of advertise the fact that I'm going to be at the front room, and anybody that wants to stop by and chat is welcome to come by, and and uh, let's have a conversation. So, um, I certainly agree with the idea in principle. Chief Pyle, would you be willing or able to work with the city and figure out how and when we might be able to use the community center? Yeah, I, but I do have to I state the obvious and I have to uh, rope in the uh, law director's office sure. to make sure that it's something that they can support from a liability standpoint because we have to be responsible stewards for taxpayer dollars. Yep. So, and I don't want to do anything that, 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 that the, the legal advisor to the city says enhances city liability. So. Uh, I can have that discussion with her tomorrow. And I can look into the university perspective in terms of using a large open space. Um, and so if we can agree in principle that we will work on this in the next week to identify some locations uh, that we could use for face-to-face. -face. And then I think it sounds like we could do the virtual piece if and when we need to. And so I would suggest that in a week, we try to develop a plan or say we can't do this thing right now and let's do this other thing. Can we, is that agreeable to folks? You can nod or great. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks Karen. Yeah. Maria, Maria Sarah, just a minute. Uh, Maria had a question somewhere in here. Maria. Hello, uh, I'm Maria Maudiel. I am an at-large member at JPAC. Um, and my question or my comment was related to a topic we were talking about, but also um, it might be also a new topic, um, but um, I put this in the chat last week, uh, but it was towards the end when we were leaving. So uh, we might not have had the chance to look at it. Um, but, and I'm not one for public statements or making statements with no action behind it, uh, but we have seen a number of organizations and public uh, folks coming out and standing in solidarity with the movement and what's happening. And um, I think it is um, something that we in JPAC should also think about, and this could be related to what we were talking about and a public uh, forum, um, but maybe even inviting uh, the public's opinion on what type of forums they want to attend or providing a space where they can put their comments and uh, maybe the chiefs go live and answer those questions um, or people on JPAC help answer those questions. So um, yeah, so that's my thought there. <clears throat> I, I, agree. I I'm just gonna just amplify Maria. I, I agree that I feel like we need to have some kind of statement outlining um, not only JPAC's work in the community, the support of the police chiefs that understand what is happening in the country and the feelings of the population, but also our next steps in terms of what we provide the community, but also that we're listening. Um, and I agree with Maria that we can't just have a statement that doesn't have action behind it, but I think the conversations we've been having, especially last week and this week, seem like there's really been a lot of progress and things going on. Sorry, Jordan. Back in the forum, I think we should remember that we can talk about community. 
and the pandemic is hitting black and brown Americans especially hard. So having an in-person forum is also an accessibility barrier in many ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think we're trying to do both hybrid, right? <laughs> and see about some available space. I mean, available space in the summer will limit our attendance. Um, but I think a hybrid, to your point, Jordan, I think we can try to make that. And if we continue to do some summer available public JPAC meetings, hopefully that would help too, and hopefully we can get the word out. What are other people's thoughts related to a public statement from JPAC, and where does that go, and what does that look like? Hey. Chad and Chad? all? Karen. Okay. <clears throat> um, I've been sort of trying to figure out where to jump in here. I'm certainly in agreement that, you know, we need to make a statement and we need to be out there. And, and I think Maria's uh, re uh, suggestion that we be visible is very, very important. But it sort of is an entree to another point. And, and she was talking about what role or somebody was talking about what role JPEG might provide. So I'll just throw this out. And I realize this is not a time where we're going to be able to discuss it in, in depth. But um, the organization Surge, Standing Up for Racial Justice, reached out to me and asked if I would put this forward to JPAC and, and suggest if there were a way that we need to start thinking about how we could ha actually have more teeth, if you will. And maybe we could either reorganize or have some kind of a subcommittee or an additional ad hoc committee uh, all related where we would actually have a uh, community oversight um, with the police. And so I don't, I'm not politically savvy enough to know how that might be organized, but I think if you, if you get the gist of it, as opposed well, to advisory that we could possibly reformulate in some way to actually have more, um, say in how things go in our community. Other, thanks, Karen. Other thoughts related to the public statement piece as well? I, I do have a, a, a comment on that. I think for the public statements, um, and I, I could be wrong just from, from listening in, um that sorry who's speaking i'm, I'm this only is andrew can you andrew, andrew checky sorry i i didn't i didn't state who it was i apologize for that uh that you know as part of a, a public statement i thinking about what do people really want to know on that front end and you know some of the obvious things that have been coming up that i have seen has been related to what is our local use of force policies? What is our most local, um, you know, how, what are the policies? What does the transparency look like um, here at the most local level um, for affecting change on a much wider, larger scale? You know, it seems really daunting, but, you know, for the community that's being served here at the most local level, they are probably, in my mind, um, myself included, really interested to know, you know, what that transparency looks like, uh, what type of uh, policies related to use of tasers, use of force es escalation policies, and what kind of training has been done and has been in place already. You know, if there's a demonstration, you know, here locally across the different departments that, you know, these types of things have, have been thought about, it's not in a reaction, you know, on the back end, because we're seeing other departments in other cities dealing with, you know, much more severe, um, you know, issues related to um, interactions of, of police and people of color, that, you know, we should, you know, share that information and explain how that works in the local community. I, I, if I might speak again, I don't know. I on a cell phone, so I don't know how to raise my hand. Go ahead. But uh, <clears throat> that was one of the things that I did learn 
by speaking with uh, Chief Pao is uh, about how there's some tracking and training and his particular, uh, uh, can't come up with the word I want, uh, philosophy, I guess it would be on his training and everything with his staff. Uh, and uh, I think those types of things need to really uh, come out more in a forum uh, and maybe as well as a written. Uh, I do also agree that there should probably, uh, even though I feel somewhat more comfortable about what I have found with the city operation, uh, some type of oversight committee, I'm highly in favor of. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I know Toby a while back was in favor of uh, sort of doing a public education uh, statement, I think from either the chiefs or from JPAC. And so maybe Toby, this couples with uh, that suggestion you had previously, this may be a little different, but I think maybe we can incorporate things from the chiefs as well. Uh, Andrew, uh, uh, to your point, to include uh, some of the trainings that OEPD and APD receive. Um, and so Mary Catherine, if you're and Maria are willing to work on a statement, I certainly would be happy to take a look at it and we could share that and get comment on that. Absolutely. Okay. I need to raise my hand. <laughs> how do I do that hand raise? There you go. That's how we're doing uh, it. Just, uh, just a quick comment about public statement is uh, I wanna uh, just remind the, the committee that, that we're, we're appointed by the mayor and the president. And I think if we're going to make a public statement uh, on something like this, the mayor and the president should be able to review it before it goes out. But if they, choose, they may choose not to, but yep. uh, if they choose to, I think it will impact them. Yep. And then on uh, community oversight um, uh, issues, the, the, the I think rather than reformulating JPAC, um, if we were, if we want to go down that road, I think something in addition to JPAC should be established. And that has to be established uh, in the city by law. And I'm not going to include uh, high university in that. that. That's a, these are two separate entities and they, they're free to, to handle uh, how they want to do civilian review boards and oversight completely different. Uh, they, we don't, we shouldn't attempt to uh, apply the same uh, civilian oversight to both departments because they they answer to, to different constituencies, quite frankly. Um, and so it would be something in my mind that, that council would have to adopt via ordinance. There will be an expense to it because uh, people that sit on civilian review board are typically paid and they are typically uh, paid to attend significant training on use of force and an officer policy and and things like that and so um, so there are those considerations so JPAC can certainly recommend uh, those kinds of things but uh, my review of, of civilian review is as much more of a program than what JPAC's intended purpose is okay uh, I'm gonna bring this topic to a close unless there are any final <coughs> like to I think Aaron had something he wanted to still contribute to. I think Aaron wanted to talk about the yes. next agenda. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, I actually did. I, I apologize. I had something on the one agenda that I wanted to get past or get out there before we passed over it. Yep. And when, when I figured out which agenda item we were on, I also had a concern about that one. Um, I, I really appreciated a lot of what was said about the timing of that, uh, of, of a community forum, especially by Liesl, who pointed out that this is something that has been discussed before, specifically in reference to the arrest of Ty Beeler that happened on Court Street by Officer Ethan Doer, I think his name is pronounced. I've never heard it said out loud. Um, this past fall, because like uh, Andrew Cheeky said, the this, this is a time to look at our local policies and see how these kind of larger national patterns are repeating themselves in our local community as well. 
Um, and that's honestly a, a very clear example of what when it is repeating itself in this local setting is that we do have cases of police being caught on film ar arresting people with what would be argued by many to be an excessive amount of force for the situation and considering that specific officer Ethan Doer is still on go in still in the middle of an ongoing uh, civil rights complaint with it, uh, in regards to his arrest of Jacob Francis earlier in 2019, and that the city of Athens is still an ongoing defendant in that same case, it seems relevant to make sure we have that community forum sooner rather than later, rather than let this, let the, the, the ongoing and still existing problem um, within this local setting sort of go by the wayside before we have a community forum that that could discuss it as a real example of what's going on here. Thanks, Aaron. Any I mean, I would just add, I, I'm just throwing, and again, I forgot to say earlier, I'm Josh Thomas. I'm the uh, <laughs> Uptown Business Representative for JPAC. Um, you know, and I would just add to that, that obviously we did, you know, we had the night at the, uh, at the Athena uh, uptown where some of those questions were answered um, and, and the chiefs were there. Um, I think that's good. And again, when I was talking about, you know, this, my, my concern was just uh, still to just get out in front of this. Um, I, I feel like both of our chiefs, I mentioned this last week, have been openly and honest and will tell you anything if you ask them. Um, I guess what I would like to see is this committee and this group and our chiefs and everybody be a little more, you don't need to ask anymore we're going to tell you we're going to get this out in front of everybody um so it's not a question people aren't we're not being reactive to it that we're being a little more proactive with it um and so with the forum idea and the statement idea i think the two go hand in hand where you're putting out a statement and you're having a forum to let the community know that we're we're getting ahead of this we want you to know where we're at what we do what our policies are before something else happens whether it's nationally locally whatever in the state before something else happens, and now we're being asked questions about it. Um, I, I just think that the community would rather see us be ahead of it than, than behind it. Um, that's just my opinion still. Thanks, Josh. Sarah, you had a, your hands Thanks. up. Yeah, I just wanted right. to say that um, relative to statement and a, a forum, I think it's, it's a great idea that they go hand in hand, like Josh mentioned, that we um, do sort of a, a brief intro about what very, very briefly where JPAC is and but then have the information available because I've had so many people ask me, well, does APD have a specific use um, use of force policy? What is it? Do they allow choke holds? What what are the policies? What's in place? And so I, I think it's important for people to be able to find that and, and know what the policies are, um, but also to know that JPAC even exists. And so somehow, and, and we've talked about this before as a group, amplifying um, our presence um, that, so that, that people know that we are here, that, that we have this, um, this tool for bridging um, what can sometimes be a gap between community and law enforcement. And that's, that's why we're here. Agreed. I think Sarah has the last comment on that topic. Only 50 <laughs> minutes in have we moved on to agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks everybody for your uh, input related to that. Uh, the next was the uh, second agenda item was a course development for APD OUPD about a uh, history of racism in America. So I don't know if uh, Tom, you want to introduce that or Jackie can comment. Uh, Just that, uh, you know, my notion for the training, I thought it would be very valuable based on my own experience for the last several months and in, in educating myself, quite frankly, uh, that that. I think it would be a tremendous benefit to police officers to uh, learn about uh, the history of racism in America and specifically, uh, or at least with a focus on law enforcement's role in racism in America, um, understanding that um, the history of racism in America is simply American history, quite frankly. 
And, um, and so, you know, the last meeting, if you weren't there, I asked uh, Jackie as a historian for some help in putting together that kind of training. And uh, she has uh, come through uh, tremendously. And so I'll let her kind of introduce what we worked on, if that's okay. Jackie, you, you want you up for that? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, so I want to make clear the, the, the purpose and thrust of this class. This is a history class. And it's going to be a history class delivered by US historians who are on the faculty at Ohio University. And we've already met twice, and we've worked together before. Um, uh, so we're, we're already well along in developing this class. Um, and I can give you a basic outline of it. Um, there are going to be four of us working on the class. We all have PhDs in US history. Um, we've taught at OU for decades. Um, we've all done research on racism in our specific fields. Um, I'm incredibly excited about this. Um, this to me is unique in, in terms of the kind of training that is offered to police departments. I have never heard of a police department asking specifically for a history class. Um, so, you know, we're, we're both, we're honored to do this and we are determined to make it incredibly engaging and um, very interactive and um, very focused and very powerful. Um, and, and what we wanted to do was make the class both chronological and topical. So each one of the four of us is taking um, what, the lead on, what, on one of the classes. So we envision doing this in four separate classes with a fifth class a, a bit distanced. Um, an open discussion at least after they've had time to absorb this. And we would do, the, do each class two weeks apart and have a number of sections because we want to make them small. So we're going to have to do each class probably two or three times, we're thinking. We're, we're, we'll iron out the details with the team. I did quite that, that quite yet. But the first class is going to be a class um, from slavery um, through Reconstruction um, and the backlash to Reconstruction. The second class will be about the 20th century, and it's going to be delivered by, um, the first class is delivered by a 19th century historian who specializes in the Civil War. The second class is going to be delivered by a 20th century historian who specializes in the history of women. So she's going to talk about 20th century racism, focusing on white women and the role white women have played in perpetuating racism, especially in terms of contacts with the police. She'll also talk about redlining. Um, all the historians will talk about how racism has been baked into US law um, from day one. So that's certainly gonna be a thread throughout. Um, the third session will be led by me. Um, I'm a medical historian, and I think that that's incredibly relevant today since we're kind of living in a crisis within a crisis right now, because this all began as, as COVID-19 unfolded as an internet, as a uh, global pandemic. And we began to watch, before George Floyd was killed, we began to watch the numbers of deaths rising and slowly learn that communities of color were being disproportionately affected by this health crisis and beginning to learn why in terms of access, in terms of um, lower pay, uh, access to health care, I mean, in terms of lower pay, in terms of types of employment, in terms of types of housing, in terms of comorbidities, why um, the black community especially was being disproportionately affected. So I'm going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about the history of race in medicine and why the black community actually fears the medical community for very good reason. That'll be the third class. The last class is being conducted by um, a historian who specializes in um, African American labor history. So she's going to be talking about the history of policing specifically in the US. And um, every class is kind of going to blend seamlessly into the other. So with my class about the history of medicine, the class on policing will begin with stereotypes, especially of the black male body, fear of the black male body. Um, so it'll kind of tie in with the history of medicine and then go into policing. So that's, that's our current vision. Um, historians, you know, we often, you know, we've all already agreed if we think one thing needs to go ahead of the other or we want to mix things up, we're going to be working closely together. Um, we intend to begin the delivery on this if we can get, you know, we're hoping to get a room in the community center 
beginning the last week of July, because we want to do it as soon as possible. And then every two weeks after that, we'll, we'll do another class. So that's the current vision. Um, I think, you know, and I've heard, I've heard Chief Pyle say, uh, an education like this could be a game changer. Um, so we're incredibly excited and honored to be part of this. Um, but just so you understand the nature of it, this is strictly about history. And it's going to be an, and delivered by uh, professional historians. And that's the vision for the class. So questions? Sarah Grace. Thank you. Jackie, this sounds like an incredible class. I'm wondering if it will be open to anyone other than our, our local law enforcement, because I, I would love to be in this class. I was going to uh, email uh, Chief Pyle to see if I could uh, sit in on the class. Um, and this is something we need to talk about. The, I think the only um, hesitation um, and, and again, this is all doable, I think, but the only hesitation is one thing we decided is we're going to do, um, again, what, we're going to do two or three of each of each, se each section um, for two reasons. One, um, police are going to have to be paid overtime to attend the class. And um, so, so uh, we're going to have to do it several times for each unit. Um, we're also concerned we want to keep it small, too, again, because we're living in the middle of a pandemic. So we want to make sure we have enough space if we invite the public in so there can be adequate distancing. Everyone understands they have to wear a mask. Um, so we'll have to figure that out. We'll have to figure that out in terms of safety terms. But, um, um, and also we want to make sure this is for the police. <laughs> you know, this is designed for the police. So we, if we invite the public, and again, that hasn't been decided yet, we'd have to decide if the public could participate. And, you know, that's, it, it might change the nature of the class. Um, uh, I know, woman, well, I know folks have questions. Aaron was joining us. He's been waiting patiently for a while to ask a question. Aaron, go ahead if you're still with us. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry for interjecting a little bit. I'm, uh, I'm actually on personal time from work right now. So I, at some point, have to disappear again. Um, but I, I did want to say about this um, history of racism course. It is it is being described as, and it does sound very interesting. It does sound something like something that would be great not just for police but also for, in theory, community members, um, those who are interested to educate themselves, and those who could learn how they themselves are somehow complicit in the system. Um, but I. I do have some concerns about that. I actually, this is part of why I wanted to be in, in this meeting was I saw that in the previous meeting on June 3rd, this was suggested, I believe, by mm -hmm. Mayor Patterson. And it was being described as, as a quote unquote game changer. But one thing that, um, so in light of everything going on, there have been more and more public displays and, and more, um, more scrutiny of how police departments are responding to these kinds of problems. And one of the things that's come to light in the past few months is that there is still no existing evidence to show that implicit bias training or, or history courses or any of these sort of classes or courses have a real effect on the way policing functions. There's no statistical correlation between these kinds of courses or education programs and the actual changes in policing um, on a day-to-day -day basis in any way. So, especially since you said they're all getting paid, that all the police attending would have to be paid overtime for this, I think it is dangerous to see this as a game changer without any real backing. Aaron, and then also it would be stewardship of uh, public funds was brought up earlier, it would be poor stewardship to pay overtime for a police force to attend classes that have no quantifiable benefit to the problem where there are actual evidence-based solutions for these kinds of problems and evidence-based solutions to move a force towards something that is more 
community minded and more based in the consent of the community. Okay, Aaron, first of all, this is by no means the only thing that we're going to be doing by any means. Um, can I ask something? I mean, uh, forgive me, but who are you? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I actually, I um, sorry, go ahead. All I see is the name Aaron. So if you could just- Sorry, I, uh, I guess I might not have, uh, I for didn't realize my name was still set from the previous Zoom meeting I was in. Um, my name is Aaron Reinhardt. I actually live right across the street from Sarah. <laughs> but uh, I, um, I'm just a community member. I mean, I've lived here for about a decade. Um, I just recently finished my master's program here. I work in town for a local organization and have for quite some time. And this is just a personal concern of mine as a member of the community, because I think that this, the, the actions of this advisory board and the actions of the police force or the actions of any public body in a given locality should be the concern of and be something accessed by as many community members as possible. But I'm sorry, I guess I didn't introduce myself very well. That was my, my mistake. No, 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 that's okay, that's okay. Um, and I appreciate your comments and other people can respond. Um, you know, I would just like to say that, that a history class like this really is unique. Um, so if you, if you refer to how history classes haven't helped, I, unless you can point to history classes that have been presented to police departments in this fashion as not working, um, I, I don't think that that's, you know, we even need to have that discussion. Um, let me also say that, um, uh, certainly historians are donating their time to this. Um, we, we, you know, no one is paying us to do this. Um, and um, I, I think it all depends on how it's delivered, how it's framed. Um, so I would, you know, say be patient with this and let's see, let's see how it plays out and what the response to it is. You know, that would be my response to what you, what oh. you said. And I welcome other people's comments. I actually, just real quick, if I may respond quickly, I don't, I don't mean to say that this would be useless. I'm all for education, especially education that relates specifically to a job like this, the, the job of being a police officer. But I, I just wanted to express the concern with the idea of it being a game changer when, um, and, and maybe I would just need more information on what makes it unique. And that's this isn't the time for it because everyone's here as a group, but I would love to hear more about it if I could get your email at some point. But, uh, but I just, I just, like I said, my concerns were the idea of it being seen as a game changer and the idea of, of stewardship of funds when, when it would be over time being paid for something that at this point, all current research has, has not shown changes police habits. Uh, and then, like I said, I could learn more from you about what the actual course is, if you'd like. Yep, and I appreciate earlier uh, in our previous meeting, Aaron, uh, Chief Powell talked about the want for this meeting and to educate uh, his police department. I believe Chief Powers did too. And so I think this is part of trying to move the needle forward uh, and a collective idea that we all got behind. And so our hope is that it will be one piece of a overall attempt for the community and for APD and OEPD. As we move forward, I, I hope I hope a community forum may also allow um, a very open discussion about what is what has efficacy, so that that a discussion of efficacy versus costs can be, you know, in the forefront for anyone to be able to weigh in on. Sure. Any other related comments to the? in response to Aaron or to Jackie or Karen, you've got your hand up. I do. <clears throat> um, I'm Karen Dawn. I, I think I forgot to introduce myself to community rep to JPAC. Um, a couple of thoughts came to mind. One is I think all the more important uh, with this particular kind of effort to keep the class for the police officers only so that that, di that dynamic is not interfered with by by others so that they have a chance to absorb and to, you know, to, to react among themselves. Um, but the second part is just uh, sort of a, a glimmer of hope. If you've listened to interviews on television or radio over the last three weeks of 
all kinds of ordinary people standing up and saying, oh my God, I had no idea. I had no idea. And I just think that this kind of course might be one of those little revelations to, to one of these, or I don't know, all of these officers. Other comments? Yeah. <clears throat> just yeah. very quickly, as far as the um, attendees, if, if we kept it, if it was decided to keep it limited to officers, perhaps our um, government channel could record it, um, just record the instructors, um, maybe not, not Q&A sessions to keep that um, perhaps so that the officers feel more comfortable in, in dialoguing, but, but record the lecture for um, members of the community to be able to view on the government channel at a later time. Mm -hmm. We actually discussed, uh, Sarah, working with UCM or others on campus to actually capture all of these sessions and sort of edit them into um, a, a product that would allow us uh, to, to, to share this training in the future. Um, I, I, I was particularly concerned about wanting to make this training something that all officers have to complete as part of their field training when they first get hired into the department. And it may not be practical to always do that in person. So having a um, kind of a video package, if you will, um, and, and also um, talked about coupling this with some training that we're working on with the Voinovich School to, um, to kind of move from, the, the way I look at this is not a, this is not a once and done solution. And I agree, Aaron, with your comments about the lack of uh, evidence to support the efficacy of uh, implicit bias training. I think part of the problem is that a lot of agencies look at that training as a checkbox process. And um, they simply send their people to this training. Oh, we've done it. And that's that. In some respects, that's driven by community narrative, because every time that an incident like this happens somewhere in the country, I immediately, and I'm sure Chief Pyle does too, get phone calls and emails from people saying, have you done implicit bias training with your officers? So there's this sort of drive to be able to answer that question with the affirmative but there's not really been any thoughtful um, examination of its efficacy. I view this as being the first step in an ongoing process. I think that before we even start talking about implicit bias, before we even start talking about um, police tactics or operations or how police functions impact um, people of color, we have to start by understanding where we came from as a nation and um, how we got to where we are today and, and then sort of break down the role that the police today play um, in, in some of these things. So to me, this is the first step. This is a long-term investment. Um, I, I don't know that we're gonna be able to measure the efficacy of just this training after it's over with, because I think that it's part of something that, that continues and, and, and goes on. So um, I, 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 I am excited about this because I do think it's a unique way of, be, of addressing this issue and beginning the process at a very foundational level. Um, and instead of jumping in at the end and saying, what, how, you know, how do police officers make traffic stops? We're going to go all the way back to the inception of this country and look at how this has developed to where we are now. Because those things contribute to the subconscious processes and subconscious biases that affect all of us, not just police officers, but everybody, and um, how that informs what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I think once once we've we've established this foundation, then we look at what our other next steps are. The training we're doing with the Voinovich School focuses on advanced um, de-escalation and and verbal skills and how we're able to take some of those tools that we are very effective at using in some circumstances and broaden them to more generalized interactions in the in the day-to-day the -day work of the police and so i see this as being an ongoing process and i think it's going to be a great foundation for that work thanks chief 
other comments related to the class or other questions? Yeah, I, as uh, a person of color, I find this to be uh, really quite exciting. And I think you can't really, you know, I've had dialogues with uh, many of my friends, uh, so-called friends, I guess, sometimes I have to think, uh, in, uh, because they really have no clear understanding of what we as people of color must go through on in a day-to-day -day, uh, interaction with our peers, to interactions with police, to whatever it may be. And, you know, uh, many of the negatives that come out uh, from my peers just happen to be because they don't live in the same world. They don't have to experience the same things that we experience. So I think that this uh, dynamic of looking back on history and, and seeing how this developed, I'm not gonna call it a game changer, but I think uh, it's definitely uh, worthy of uh, paying somebody the overtime to uh, have them uh, through this learning, learning session because uh, my only concern is, is how much does it, uh, without seeing it, I don't know how much of it is you know, truly related to the black culture versus not related to the black culture. And that's not any uh, criticism against the people that are putting it together. I don't know who all was involved in putting it together, but uh, uh, that's, that would be my only reason for really wanting to see it. I think it's, I think it's important that, uh, that a certain number of people are allowed to audit the class, quite frankly. Um, I think that that would be good. It would add some uh, validity, I guess, is the word I would use, uh, or at least an opportunity to, to critique uh, the content. And so now who that is, and, and you know, I, I think that's all debatable, but I think there is opportunity to allow a certain number of people into the class to audit it. And, uh, not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly fine with that. And I would just say, I, I, I heard, I keep hearing the word uh, game changer. I think the word that I used was could be a game changer. Nobody really knows because we want to measure the impact of, of something like this. But what I do know is, is it's never been offered uh, to my police department. And I've been here 31 years and it's never any, a course like this has never been offered. And I am not I looked for a course like this in law enforcement training. Lieutenant Conley and Chief Powers can tell you, I don't, I've never seen literature on the history of racism in America with an emphasis on the law enforcement role in racism in America, the historical uh, uh, perspective. And so at this point, I don't, I certainly don't think it could harm anything. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Jackie, could you give us an insight into who the other uh, folks that will be teaching the courses would be? Yeah, I, I mean, and I, I'll give names first and any descriptors you want. Um, Brian Shane, who is the incoming chair of the History Department at OU, Catherine Jellison, who is the outgoing history, uh, chair of the History Department, and Robin Muhammad, who is the outgoing chair of African American Studies, and me. So it's, it's going to be the four of us. Um, in terms of, you know, I, 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 Henry's point is very valid. We only have one historian um, who's a U.S. historian at OU who is African American, and that's Robin. Um, and she is, she's part of the team. She specializes in um, African American labor history. Um, we certainly would have more Black historians, U.S. historians, if we had them, but... Um, and, but, you know, I also want to point out one of the things that we talked about last week and that I've certainly talked, we've certainly been talking about at Ohio University is that it's really important that white people be talking to white people about white, white racism. So I certainly, you know, make no apologies for um, the racial composition of this team. And I wish we could do better. But again, um, the only black historian who does U.S. history at OU is, is absolutely part of our team. 
Thanks, Jackie. We have about 14 minutes left. <laughs> we can continue on this topic. If folks have a question, Karen has a comment. Real quick, um, I'm a WOUB uh, public radio fan. Uh, just a couple of days ago on the program Fresh Air, uh, a, a historian named Elizabeth Hinton from Harvard University, um, all about police history, way back from the very, very beginning. So you could probably Google Fresh Air and find her or, or her, her own name, Elizabeth Hinton. Um, so Chief Pyle or anybody else, if you want to read about it, uh, there is work out there. Um, just to let you know. Thanks, Karen. And speaking of WOUB and Sarah's point about recording, I actually have already contacted WOUB to see if they would be interested in recording these classes. Um, so there, we have all kinds of possible avenues for how we can make this more public. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to, I'd like to hop in just for a second because my hand's up and buttons up for a little bit and I just want to pop in. Sorry, um, I'm going to keep track of all that stuff. You're totally can... fine. I just didn't want to cut somebody off, but I didn't want to forget. Uh, so I'm, I'm Mary Catherine Tran. I represent unrepresented constituents at Ohio University. I'm also working DNI. And so I'm wondering, Jackie, if it's possible as you and your team start um, developing the syllabus, uh, I don't know if it's a syllabus or like your program plan. I would love to be able to share that with my colleagues and also with the students we work with. We work with the, like obviously a major um, mighty groups of students of color and other diverse students as well. And so when they come with questions that when they start hearing about this course, I wanna be able to tell them what's going on. And with that, I would love for some for someone from DNI, which is diversity inclusion, to be able to sit in on the course so we know what to explain to people, we know how to talk to them about what's happening and about why this is happening um, before we could fully get behind what's going on. Because I'm sure it's going to be amazing and great and really informative, but I want DNI in particular to know what's happening, what it looks like and what we can expect and what our students can expect that, that police officers are being trained on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell that to the historians I'm working with, absolutely. And, you know, th again, this is a work in progress, and we've just started to share ideas with each other. So, um, you know, be patient, and, and we're, we're, we're working on it. But, I, you know, I think that we're, you know, I'll check with them, but I think that we're going to be happy to share this with most anyone. Apologize, I had to step out. Um, and, but I heard Karen talking about uh, referring uh, WUB program or something uh, on topic. And so I have actually been amassing a considerable amount of resource material, books and, and things that I've been absorbing. And so I'd be happy to share that with uh, JPAC members if you're interested in, in uh, advancing your education on, on uh, you know, personally. Uh, some of the, the things that I've encountered have been uh, transformative for me, quite frankly. So, um, yeah, so I'm happy if you, how about everybody, if you want it, just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you that way. I'm not uh, giving you unsolicited info. It looks like Aaron has another question. Oh, I, I was just going to ask before I, uh, never mind. Sorry. I, I actually should have put the hand down a minute ago. It got answered, but that's, that's my mistake. <laughs> Good. Okay. Anything else related to the history class? Josh. I can't hear you, Josh. There we go. Sorry about that. There we go. No worries. Uh, I would just, I would, all I would throw in there, Jackie, is if you're looking for space, obviously my store is pretty big. And if you don't have, you know, I don't know how many participants you would have, and if, but if you were doing it in the evening, especially here in the summertime. I know my wife and I would be happy to close up, let you have the place. I'm sure we could provide you a nice figure on a coffee and some snacks too. Um, Cause again, we, I know we both think it's a great idea. You know, and if, so if you need some space, let us know. Boy, is that a wonderful offer. So if we can't, if we can't do the university or the rec center, we have a space now. Right, right. Just let us know. Let us know. Obviously when the school year rolls around, we get a little bit busier, but uh, we could even still find the time because this is an, it's important. I think it's a great thing. So yeah, my apologies. I actually have prearranged with the community center to uh, get all the halls that we need to uh, host 40 to 50 people at a time, maintain uh, the, the appropriate social distancing at the community center. 
Um, and I have the, I believe the first date that, that we agreed in the, our little, uh, our, the, the academic work group was uh, uh, end of July, last week of July on a Wednesday. I think that date was available. Well, I could tell you that, that at least the director down there said, whatever you need, we'll make it happen. Uh, so uh, we're kind of batting emails back and forth. And I haven't heard from them uh, since yesterday, but but uh, the community center is is definitely a viable space, at least uh, based on everything I've heard from them so far. So, so that puts it on July 29th, Tom. Is that correct? Uh, let me look at my calendar real quick, and I'll tell you. Sorry, I know it was the last Wednesday in July. And, and then I explained to them that we were going to do a course every other week uh, and that we would need the room. It was July 29th um, and that theoretically, at least preliminarily, tentatively, however you say that, uh, we would do a, a course every other week and that we would need the room both in the morning and in the evening so that we could accommodate shift working employees and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, we could potentially do this the 29th of July, 12th of August, 26th of August, and uh, 9th of September. But it, do I hear you correctly that at this time that's limited to uh, your staff to APD? No, no. Uh, we were thinking 40 to 50 people per class that would accommodate both departments. And then we can actually, I'm sure, accommodate uh, groups larger than that. Uh, Maria made a comment uh, via the chat that I think it was Maria uh, mm -hmm. that that it would be good for JPAC members to audit the class and so that they could have discussions with their own co uh, communities that they represent on JPAC and I think that is a brilliant idea and and a kind of what I was going at when I said you know somebody should be auditing the course quite frankly mm -hmm. um, and and I'm hoping that uh, you know we, we get this course through and and that we think of ways that can we can further develop it and um, you know quite frankly I think I think this this topic should be taught in elementary school as a piece of curriculum uh, and it's just my personal opinion so. um, I want uh, to move on for just a minute as we just have a few minutes left what are folks feelings about our next meeting Perhaps something next week or the week of the uh, 22nd of June. I, I expect to be on leave uh, the week of the 22nd. Okay. Uh, lost lost my count. People have feelings about next week. Fine by me. Yeah, if you want to do another doodle poll, that was seemed like a good way to go. Um, um, can I express as a community community member real quick, since these are open to the community, um, I actually had discussed this meeting with a few people and I was the only one who was able to attend and even I had to sort of get the go ahead from my work. So, so I, I just wanted to express as a community member that it might be worth also not just prioritizing Every, all the uh, appointees and whatnot, but trying to make it outside of the, the regular work hours of community members, just so that it can be a little more accessible to the community. Because uh, I think Sarah had said how a lot of people don't actually know this group exists at all. Mm -hmm. And this could sort of help bridge that. Thanks, Sarah. So I guess we're saying maybe, maybe more of an evening time or or our normal time was like at five or five thirty. Maybe that works a little bit better for everybody. We we could do a five thirty next Thursday, or I can send out the poll. What's people's preference? Five thirty Thursday is okay with me. Yeah, that works for me. What, I'm okay with it. What date time? It would be uh, Thursday, June 18th at 5.30 p.m. What will we... Uh, what would the agenda be? Yeah, I mean, what, what, is, what will we be discussing? I don't know that we'll have many more developments on this training. Um, uh, so, I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but... Um, 
I'm comfortable moving it two weeks from now, or even if we moved it into what would be our regularly scheduled mm -hmm. July 2nd or July 9th, but that puts us a month out. And I think that's a little too long based on our conversations. You know, I think, I think thinking out loud, I think we ought to just have it next Thursday, quite frankly. That's yeah. my opinion. Even if it's a short meeting, but we're still, let's, let's keep, keep the topic going. Yeah. yeah. Actually, and, uh, Chad, also, um, I think we could have the public statement by then. So if uh, we circulate that and the meeting could be about what the next steps are. Yeah. So can we agree on next Thursday, June 18th at 5.30 p.m.? Sounds good for me. It's on my calendar. Okay. Yep. Will do. And if there, there's always a meeting where someone can attend, we know that. Um, and so we will make that. If you could include that in the minutes, Jackie, that would be helpful. I will. Do we do we have now uh, an updated list of everyone's email address so that we can email to the board members um, specific by name invitations? I think we can do that. And uh, I'll check with Scott Thompson on that. I think, I think we do. The issue we ran into, I think in part, was the fact that we that the term goes through to August 31st. And there are some people coming on from the city, of course, and off from the university and students. And so I put the request in the president's office to have those two positions filled on our side. Okay. But I think we have the list. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, certainly I appreciate everybody's time. Um, I will, will do, Andrew Chicky. I saw your note. Uh, we'll make sure this is aware so we can post a date and time and agenda uh, with the city. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your time. For those of you who are able to join us online, we certainly appreciate uh, you joining us. Uh, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day today. Okay. Can I say, can I say one thing? Because I'm realizing I, I probably can't get the minutes out before the next meeting because I'm not going to be in town for most of the time until then. So if this can be publicly announced, we can't, what I'm saying is don't count on the minutes to announce the next meeting because <laughs> I might not get them done before next Thursday. So, okay. um, so yeah, however we announce this, be, sh be sure it's publicly announced then. When and if you want to send them to me, Jackie, and I can try to clean them up or help out whatever you need, I can do that too. Oh, I see it. Oh, these are all handwritten, so. Okay. <laughs> I, I just think they're scribbling, yeah. Okay, we'll post them when we have them available. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Thanks so much, everybody. Good to see everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.